activities that are, you know, we think of more in the realm of like recreational things, dancing, dancing is just, you know, such a bonding human activity, mm -hmm. um, especially dances that require you to learn steps and coordinate your movements with other people like those, as it turns out, predispose us to, to wanting to work together. Mm. Just, you know, that we, we are better problem solvers when we've had a chance to do something physical that requires us to coordinate our movements together. Hi, welcome to another episode of the Name It podcast. I am your host, Jonas Oganowski. This podcast is all about exploring and naming the deeper meanings, metaphors, and insights underneath our guests' passions, projects, and professions. I sit down with people from all walks of life to find out what brings them alive. This is the second episode in a special series exploring the reimagining of education. Rather than prescribing answers or singular solutions, my aim is to talk to people from all areas of education and to learn and explore with my guests what are the emerging questions, challenges, and opportunities. My guest today is Susan Rock. Susan is an educational researcher and personal coach with expertise in body-mind awareness and is committed to inclusive education through immersive sensory experiences of linguistic and cultural diversity. She's also the author of the book Minding Bodies, how physical space, sensation, and movement affect learning. Susan is currently serving as Fulbright Canada Distinguished Research Chair in the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning at Carleton University in Ottawa, Ontario. You can find her full bio and other resources mentioned in the episode in the show notes. We talk about Susan's book, Minding Bodies. We talk about immersive place-based sensory learning, neuroscience behind embodied integrated and experiential learning, we talk about Susan's six principles of embodied cognition, how advanced mobility relates to the complexity of our brains and learning, how poverty and bandwidth recovery are important for learning and decision making, the importance of spaces in communicating belonging and supporting learning, and we talk about how reimagining education is important for our collective capacity to address wicked global problems. I found this conversation to be both eye-opening, inspiring, and reassuring. So whether you are a parent, a teacher, or someone who cares about the education of our future generations, I think you will get a lot from this episode. So without further delay, here is me talking with Susan Rock. Thank you, Susan, so much for making the time to uh, join me in conversation. And I'm very happy to, to have you on the podcast. Thank you. I'm so happy to join you. Yes. And uh, perhaps for the listeners um, to give them an idea of, of where we are sitting as, as we're having this conversation, um, whereabouts are you Zooming from today? So I am zooming from my home in Columbus, Georgia. It's um southwest of Atlanta mm -hmm. and it's on the Chattahoochee River. So as I look across out of my window across the river, I can see Alabama. Oh wow, beautiful. And uh and home for me is in a converted uh cotton mill. So I'm I have a exposed brick and and cement um floors from the old textile mill that used to be on the river here for its um for the the power of the uh of the river to supply energy to uh making cotton textiles oh wow that's fascinating there you go uh so i'm sitting here in in brisbane in australia as i usually am um and i there is a river um, outside of a window to my left um, I just can't see it from here because there's a um, a roof of another house and a palm tree um, in front of that but it's a uh, um, slightly different uh, location to, to where you are right yes. right 
So I and we're uh, in we're in opposite seasons, I guess, at the moment. It's spring here and fall for you. Yes, we're in opposite seasons, opposite times of the day. I'm in the morning, mm-hmm. you're in the afternoon. Very yes. interesting, especially given some of what we might be talking about today with uh, what you've researched and written about in your book. So uh, I I so I have uh, given a, a more detailed introduction to to listeners. Uh, before we've started talking. Um, but I would really like to hear from you uh, to sort of tell us a little bit about um, how you came about this kind of work, how you became interested in um, uh, education and more embodied ways of engaging and supporting uh, learning. Uh, so if you could just give us a bit of a description about that, yeah. and then I'll also introduce your book as well. Sure. Well, so I um, started in higher ed um, as an um, an expert in early British and world literatures and in writing, teaching writing, and um, sort of made my way through the early years of an academic career, um, trying to be published on early modern women writers and um, archival work that I had done. But the university where I'm employed is um, primarily a teaching focused university and it's a regional public school in Georgia. So it um, it's it's not especially selective. We welcome a you know wide range of Uh, backgrounds of our students and that's one of its strengths it's a really diverse student body and um, so the other really interesting opportunity I had as a as a new junior faculty member was to bring students to England on study abroad trips and then after that to um, Italy and these were all programs that I got to design from scratch and plan all of the logistics and, you know, when was the train leaving and how much were the tickets going to cost and the entire sort of travel agent slash academic, you know, um, leader at all in one. And um, so when I had the opportunity to teach those courses, I couldn't help but notice how much more engaged and um, genuinely interested in older literatures the students were. It's really hard to engage students in um, ancient and early modern literature. You know, they just tend to not feel that it's super relevant. And even if you do a great job at, you know, introducing them to some really surprising and exciting texts from, you know, cultures that are foreign to them and time periods that were long, long ago. Um, There's something about being in the place itself and being immersed in, you know, the, the place where the writer lived or where the characters, you know, where it's set that just changed the whole enterprise. And so I, um, I started getting interested in how that sensory experience of being immersed in a place must really, you know, make the difference. And I started reading some neuroscience on, you know, sensory learning. And so I started reading Antonio Damasio on how um, the body affects our emotional um, processes. And then, you know, I just went down a rabbit hole and was super, super interested in the ways that our brain, in fact, is um, not se- separate from the rest of our bodies. In fact, our bodies are highly um, involved in every process that of our brains. And so, um I was, you know, started out with the idea that I wanted to address just people who teach history or historical time periods and the ways that we could use more um, immersive kinds of experiences to teach our our disciplinary, um, uh, you know, uh, areas. Mm -hmm. But then um, in trying to find the right publisher, which was, you know, a, a long 
difficult process and the right editorial um, um, team, I I was persuaded to um really just double down on this idea of you know what would what would teaching look like if we decided to focus on the body and not worry too much about restricting it to an audience of humanities professors but to speak to to all the disciplines you know how would how would higher education look different if we didn't treat everyone like a brain on a stick and so that's how the book came about. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's uh, um, a brain on a stick. I believe that that's the the metaphor that you sort of open the the book with, which um, has such a um, oh, for, I guess for me a jarring and profound kind of uh, recognition of essentially what what education has looked like and the purpose it's served and how it's sort of treated us um and i so i i did read your book uh it's called and i'll include this on the show notes of the podcast um it's got a great picture on the front hopefully that's not reversed <laughs> at least for me on this video uh, it's called yeah. minding bodies how physical space sensation and movement affect learning um and i there's sprinkled throughout uh if people i definitely rec recommend anyone go out and uh read this book um but especially those who might be involved either directly or indirectly in education so parents teachers faculty members people within um policy um around education um so I definitely recommend that. And there's there's all these metaphors um, that you include throughout the book and speak about metaphors as well, such as the, the brain on the stick. Um, perhaps, actually, before we uh, sort of start to talk about perhaps one of the, one more of the, uh, the concepts that you open with as we talk about the book, uh, very briefly, if you're happy to, you, you, you you don't have to uh, talk about it, but just how would you describe perhaps in a, in a sentence or a few sentences your own experience, if you were ha had to sort of label it or describe it, of, of going through school and education yourself? Mm. Yeah. Um, well, I was a um, always, I think, a a successful, pretty high performing student. I recognize now that um, I was unusual in that um, the sedentary classroom didn't completely um, undermine my ability to learn. Um, so I, I didn't struggle much in school. I loved school. I've always really loved school. Um, but I, um, I also am a person who really, you know, enjoys, um, physical activity. Uh, we, we, we lived in a number of different places when I was growing up. And so, you know, my elementary school years were spent in the state of Minnesota, which is, you know, a, a place with long, hard winters. And when you're a kid, I think the the real blessing there is that you don't really seem to be a subject to um, extreme temperatures as adults are, I think. So I spent, well, and this was also the seventies. So I was allowed to be, you know, outside from mm. morning till night with friends. We, you know, just uh, enjoyed our, our time in the outdoors. And um, I had plenty of just risk taking and exploring and, doing kid things um away from screens um that that I think really benefited me in ways that um kids growing up today are you know struggle to find um but I always was a a big reader and yeah. you know yeah. that's how I ended up um pursuing English as a discipline but I also did um studies in um modern languages and I was a German major as well. So mm -hmm. I liked um, just the 
the the the interest of cultural difference and travel have always been a big part of um what drives me yeah well um i yeah it sounds like while you were a part of probably very much the education system that a lot of people are um yourself and maybe others uh, the there's those parts of us as human beings um, that are embodied and connected um, that can survive the system. Um, yeah. But that doesn't mean we should sort of uh, rest on our laurels and think, great, you know, a few of us survive, so it, <laughs> it's, it must be fine. That's right. Yeah. So I, how about we sort of dive in a little bit around um, definition of some terms that we might um, come across mm -hmm. during the conversation. Um, and I'd like to talk about uh, the principles of embodied cognition, which is mm -hmm. there are six principles that you uh, sort of open with and frame the the the, um, the book around and that you return to throughout the book. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I'd like to, perhaps I can sort of mention them and then you could talk a little bit about um, how you understand that and, and why that's important. So the the six principles of embodied cognition, um, perhaps as a concept in uh, in a whole, how would you sort of describe that and, and where that comes from? Yeah, well, so I am was so grateful for um, books that I was able to um learn from that that already sort of translate neuroscience into um a more you know accessible language for a general reader but because embodied cognition um is all about the um non-linear kind of processes that our our brains and bodies follow when we're perceiving the world around mm -hmm. us i really struggled to figure out how to describe that to people it's not a you know we we've operated under this idea i think for a, a long time that um uh you know the eyes see an object and then that image is communicated to the brain and then the brain you know makes sense of what the eyes have perceived and it's just a lot a lot less kind of orderly and linear than that so the six principles that I came up with were really a way for me to identify um the top ways that this this um explanation of how human um um thinking and and cognition works that would would help sort of round out um anybody's understanding of how it's it's not the sort of computational process we might have thought absolutely um actually it, it's interesting because i'm i'm sort of like now what you've described as taking me to something you say towards the end of the book, but in terms of helping, it sounds like by coming up with the, um, the six principles of embodied cognition, mm -hmm. wanting to encourage a new lens or an understanding of learning um, and how, who we are as beings with minds and bodies Mm -hmm. and relationships and communities and um so giving a new framing or a new understanding that has some more i think you said rounding that out um mm -hmm. and uh oh you talked about um i think did you talk about calculations at the end there that sort of used a bit of a a mechanical term and at the mm -hmm. end of the book you talk about wanting to change the metaphor um, of education as rather than a factory production line um, into more of um, it's about a garden and and gardening yes. did you want to perhaps talk about what that means for you 
Sure. Yeah. And I mean, I think I, I'm happy that you called attention to the cover of the book because mm -hmm. um, I did go back and forth with the artist a bit about exactly how to make this image convey um, what the book's really wanting yeah. to to yeah. explain. So there's yep. a dotted line that goes mm -hmm. along the outlines of a skull. Mm -hmm. A human skull and it's dotted because one of the important concepts in our embodied cognition is that our the the exterior of our bodies our skin mm -hmm. our you know what we think of as inside and outside may be a little bit more permeable than we think that you know we are hugely infected affected by our environment our immediate environment and so our cognition does not take place inside a sealed vacuum, you know, uh, in which our brains operate the same way, no matter what the external environment is. Mm -hmm. um, and then inside of that permeable skull is sort of a, a figure who's, who's in motion and who is surrounded by um, sort of stylized leaves, um, mm -hmm. which is an attempt to kind of communicate the importance of nature and um, the, our connection to the environment on our cognitive processes and the fact that we are built to move and we're whole bodies who are, you know, typically um, thinking best when we're um, in a dynamic motion um, um, immersive environment. Yeah, yes. Yeah, I appreciate the the design, and and it's it's great to hear your um, take on where that came from. So it's sort of helped to to um, portray that even more. Mm -hmm. uh, so the first principle, um, speaking of motion, is uh, like clouds or waves, to use um, analogies. Our bodies are in a state of constant motion. Hopefully, right. Yes. Right. Yes. And right. Uh, I, I sort of I'd understand internally and externally. There's there's as you mentioned with the dotted line. So did you want to talk a little bit more about that first principle? Yeah, sure. So um, inside of of our human bodies are all of our systems going all the time. Our circulation of our um, blood, which is carrying with it you know, chemicals, hormones, all of those sorts of things that affect um, how our brain's being fed. And then there's lots of mechanical movement going on. Bodies are a lot more mechanical, I think, than we typically appreciate. You know, they're, our, our skeletal structures and our muscle structures are, um, you know, very... Um, amenable to being manipulated you know there's I, I think in in modern life and maybe partly mm -hmm. because of this idea that our brains are like little computers we I think we feel so shocked when like um we learn that um the you know the lymphatic system for example needs to be um drained through mechanical stimulation you need to be you know that's why a massage let you know kind of releases all of this um potential you know to toxins that you want to drink lots of water after a massage so it gets um you know washed through um washed out and um you know, because we're meant to move in a lot of different ways and in a lot of different directions, that's how the lymph system's designed to work. It's, you know, so um, anyway, there's lots of motion inside of your body. And then um, this concept of um, proprioception is yeah. super interesting. And it's the ways that we um are able to sense where our limbs are in space and our you know the position of our bodies um that we have some sense of of how our bodies are without you know needing to double check that mm. um and yeah so the fact that 
we're we're creatures who can move in so many different ways and are you know exceptional in as a species in that way um has informed the way our brains developed and so you know a lot of um of neuroscientists or cognitive scientists think that the reason why the human brain is so elaborate and um, complex has to do with the ways that we develop physically and that where our abilities to move in so many different ways um, are, you know, account for why our brains are so large and complex. And mm. so if you think about other creatures, I mean, um, you know, other animals are, are much faster than we are or can you know sw swim much more effectively than we can but that might be the only motion that they that they're really ex excellent at right mm -hmm. like i'm a great leopard but i can't sit cross-legged you know like uh, humans can can be in a million different positions and we're we're pretty amazing in that way I really found it uh, a uh, fascinating insight um, just around that uh, as human beings, intuitively, I always, we could understand that we're unique in many ways from, from other species and other animals. Um, in many ways, other animals are far superior to us in their capacities and their uh, resilience um, and one of the interesting points that you raise in the book is that one of the things that makes humans unique is not necessarily that we can adapt and we're flexible in terms of the ways that we relate with each other um, and among each other and not necessarily that we can work together in large uh, numbers because there might be i think you know ants termites bees mm -hmm. can work in in some respects almost larger numbers but it's the fact that we can do both of those together which is really quite fascinating um yeah yeah so oh and and that you uh, i'm not sure if you might have quoted this from someone else and forgive me for i haven't got it on hand but that human beings are the swiss army knives of motion i thought that was fantastic yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think that's John Rady who who wrote the book Spark. Um oh. um and that's a yeah, that's a a book that um has uh high regard in educational circles. That's um he's a physician who's also mm -hmm. interested in the ways that, you know, physical activity affect our thinking processes. Yeah, the Swiss Army knives of motion. It's a it's a great metaphor, and you know I think it it does um, it does offer us like a a really nice insight into the ways that we are unique, but also creatures of this planet. You know, and as you were saying, there are other species who have really exceptional abilities that are beyond ours in certain ways. And that also informs the way that they perceive the world, right? So um, there are specialists in dog cognition, which who who I find super interesting. They're doing a lot of great work in that. And so there's a um, dog cognition specialist named Alexandra Horowitz, who wrote a book called 11 Ways of Looking, I think. And she mm -hmm. takes a walk around the block in New York City with... 11 different companions to illustrate the ways that our bodies inform and in our in our particular interests inform the way that we perceive the same environment so a dog walks around the block perceiving the smells for example in a much more acute way than a human might but even humans who have different um, capacities or different, you know, of a, a um, people of different heights or people who have different 
expert kinds of expertise that they've developed see the same um external reality with attention to much different sorts of aspects of it so you know we're just we're shaped our perception is is hugely shaped by um the the abilities of our bodies and the capacities of our um you know of our what, what we know from experience and and that gets into maybe the um maybe this is yeah the second of the principles mm -hmm. of embodied cognition which is that you know we can't we just literally can't take in everything all at once mm -hmm. and so um our brains are such huge users of energy um that we they they've developed this this um strategy for um being energy efficient and that is that instead of walking around like some wide open receiver of all you know sensory signals the brain is just constantly working you know fractional of, of seconds ahead of of the senses to predict what it expects in this particular context so based on all of our prior experiences including prior experiences of um you know shows we've watched things we've seen on television you know those are all lodged as you know like oh remember the dark alley don't you know that's a place mm. that might be dangerous um so that we frequently um kind of uh are, are led to perceive things that um may not even be real because that's what our brains expect to see in that situation um or we miss things that we might you know be have be surprised to discover because we just weren't expecting to see it in that context so i mean that's a, one of the reasons why it's hard to remember someone's name when you see them in a mm -hmm. completely different place than you're used to seeing them right or even recognize their face right you go oh wait a minute what's that person doing here you know because you're used to only seeing them in this familiar context and yeah that's really interesting there was i think there was a um uh, an analogy that you might have used in terms of uh, seeing who we, I think it was something about experience. You can correct me on this, but something about experiences coming in waves and that there's sort of mm. the, rather than um, sort of separate distinct moments, there's, there's waves of experience and there's the onset and the rising, and then there's the falling away. And that in very in, in very many ways sort of learning can happen in that falling away where we are perhaps the brain's doing that. Okay. Everything that's just happened, this, um, whether it's a static and tedious, you know, lecture hall experience where I'm sitting and not moving for hours. Um, and the only thing I remember is trying to stay awake or if we're, if the, the experience was one of, uh safe yet novel and um interesting experience outdoors with the teacher and we were you know um i learned something new about um this moment in history and and what that means for me and there's that's where that reflection and that um incorporating into that um part of the brain happens and occurs so yeah, i guess yeah yeah yeah, it take well, so it takes a lot of energy to um recognize that there's a mismatch between what we expected to happen and what signals we're getting that, you know, could counter those expectations. And so if you're really tired and you don't have the energy to summon up to like recognize and learn, oh wait, this is a different situation. I I have to re calibrate my expectation for the next time then you literally your brain might just ignore the contradictory input like mm -hmm. 
I just don't have the energy to deal with that right now. So we're moving along here. I mean, brains are just not that reliable. They, they, they will conserve energy so that if, if they don't have enough energy to um, learn something new, like they'll just like, they're moving along. They're not, they're not going to be capable of taking that yeah. in and, and using it to inform future predictions. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a really, um, it speaks to the importance of what young people, you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, but we could extend that to just all of us as hopefully lifelong learning becomes more and more a part of um, normal culture. Um, I guess that's my bias, my yes. um, value. Yes, no, I agree. Yeah, mm -hmm. that that the importance of not just what happens in the quote unquote uh, moment of educational learning setting, um, but our how we uh, you know uh, manage our health and our I think sleep is a huge one that you highlight in the book. The importance of sleep, um, uh, our diet, our relationships. Um, all of those things really inform how much we can we can draw from and take from those yeah specific absolutely experiences. yeah it's um so that's a great um uh opportunity to to recommend another book that i found so important mm -hmm. and influential which was this concept of um of ban the mental bandwidth cognitive mm -hmm. bandwidth um, which comes from actually some work by um, an economist and a psychologist um, on in this book called Scarcity um, mm -hmm. that was about poverty. And what they were basically explaining is that um, poverty reduces the amount of cognitive bandwidth that you have because you're exhausted most of the time and you're not well nourished and mm. you're worried about 500 different survival issues that um that then reduce your ability to make what what other people would think of as wise choices or you know good good decisions because your brain is just um not operating on all cylinders um and so um bandwidth recovery is a, a an adaptation of that concept um by it's a book that's a books bandwidth recovery by sia versheldon how do i spell um, the first name yeah, yeah sia is c-i-a mm -hmm. Ver, versheldon with a v okay um and she talks about the ways that um, so many students come to the learning, to school, to the learning moment um, with super limited cognitive bandwidth for those same reasons. They are worried about um, a family member who's ill or their, you know, unreliable transportation or some emotional difficulty that, you know, they've, they've, they're going through a relationship breakup or, um, oh, I mean, students have really sometimes incredibly difficult life circumstances. Um, you know, they've got insecure food and housing issues. And so to expect people to be able to learn well under those conditions, is just, um, Un unfair and unreasonable really it's uh i mean i i feel like we could go down the 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 path of yeah the importance of those realities for students mm -hmm. um, yeah and yeah even if they were had the opportunity to access really great learning um mm -hmm. environments if their lives are still like that there's you know there's yeah. a big impact, let alone if they've got all those things going on and then um, they're going into less than optimal, you know, human um, mind right. and body thriving yeah. um, learning environments. Although, yeah, I mean, 
the 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 strategies of that are that are described in Vera Sheldon's book though are and I'm with her in this um um approach are about you know what we can do to help people recover some of that bandwidth that you know rather than just throw up our hands and say well it's wow that's just too bad um as teachers what we should be thinking about is how we can welcome learners into a classroom as a space where they feel safe and but that they belong and that someone believes in their capacity to succeed and that they're going to be given authentic tasks that are relevant and are um, stimulating and that hold them to high expectations, you know, mm. but, but that with the understanding that, um, you know, we, we believe in your capacity to, to reach these high expectations, but we're going to, you know, we're going to expect that, um, you excel in the ways that we expect learners to excel at this particular level, you know, whatever the, the grade level or the level of higher ed that you're working in. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's not about lowering your standards, but about, Mm, giving the enough support to the learners yep. to um to encourage them to mm. um to reach to reach high yeah and i think it's you can't really underestimate um uh, or overestimate sorry the value of those moments in school mm -hmm. if it's school for example yeah um yeah i uh, some years ago, I was involved with a um, an independent and alternative school here in uh, Brisbane, and they. I remember one of the first stories they told. Uh, uh, so I was sitting on the board, and one of the first stories they told was of um, a young uh, boy who had. Uh, so he came with his father to um, to see if the school would be a fit. And he was constantly anxious, um, really struggled, not just to learn, but to um, feel confident and safe and, and um, would mm -hmm. frequently, you know, uh, skip going to school because he just couldn't handle it um, and come home crying. And apparently after the first day or two of coming into a school environment that was supportive and recognizing of his full self as a human being and not just sitting and receiving information um, mm -hmm. at a desk. Uh, he didn't want to leave school. So it completely changed oh. his experience in terms of um, while there are challenges that he may have been having outside of school, um, mm -hmm. as you said, it's, it's um, not just thinking that there's nothing that can be done and um, sort of throwing yeah. our hands up, but the, the value yeah. of a really good um, learning environment. Right. I mean, school can be a place of real joy and um, learning itself. It can be so healing. Yes, it can. So true. Um, how about we uh, move on to a few of the other principles? Yes. We don't have to sort of go in depth in all of them. Um, I, mm -hmm. I encourage people to go and get the book so that they can read more <laughs> about how they actually apply. Um, the next one is that our efficient bodies, we engage tools, um, technologies, and other people as well to extend our capacities. And I think you use the word affordances, things that yes. afford us new capabilities. Yes. Yeah, so the the concept of an affordance was from the psychologist James Gibson um, in the late 60s, I believe. And the idea is that an affordance is all about the function or use um, of an object for humans. That this is all about perception as well, you know, that you perceive objects according to their use value. And so, um, you know, the, 
the smartphone, of course, is an affordance that we now perceive as being a lot of different, having a lot of different uses or functions, right? It's not only um, a way to a connection to the other human beings who we love and, you know, want to stay in touch with, but it's a um, source of, you know, amusement, consolation, um, you know, a memory, it's a storage for memory because you can uh, query now any sort of, you know, mm -hmm. thing that you forgot and, and call up those facts. And yet, um, if the smartphone is out of Wi-Fi or you don't <laughs> have data or it's, you know, malfunctioning in some way, it's, um, it becomes a useless object pretty quickly, right? It's not, you know, it's only because it's an affordance to all of those things that it's valuable. And so affordances in the classroom are, you know, all of the different objects that we can make use of to um, to, to be able to um, be extensions of our brains, basically. And other people are also extensions of our brains. And so humans are wired to be really social and mm -hmm. we think well with each other. And so um, that's a, that interaction within a classroom can be one of the really important ways that we um, learn because we're, we're using other people as affordances to understanding things. Yes, you, you, there's that um, idea that you explored in the book of uh, role playing and uh, mm -hmm. taking on different characters, perhaps whether that's from history or um, that where students get the opportunity to take on a different uh, character, a different perspective mm -hmm. and worldview, and um, they can try on different uh emotions or experiences that can give them a, a completely different um, perspective on things. Um, I did want to check and um, I didn't check at the beginning, but in terms of time, because I want to respect your time, mm -hmm. uh, whether yeah. you would like us to finish um, in the hour or if, if you have a bit more uh, flexibility. I, I have, I have extra time. If you, if you want to continue chatting. Sure. Cool. Um, I, I'm sure I could uh, continue chatting and asking questions for a long <laughs> time. How about we we give ourselves um, would uh, 10 a.m. as a finish work for you, or what's a time that you would like to um, close by? Uh, well, let's see. Is that would that be in like 35 minutes from now? It would be. Yep. Yeah. Yes, that's fine. Sure. That works. Okay. Uh, I do all my own editing as well, so I can edit out okay. the, little, the little pieces. Um, so just to, to bring us back, talking about those, um, those affordances and those, the value that we mm. might um, be able to gain uh, from tools, technologies, our phones, um, and mm -hmm. also from the relationships. And I, it makes me want to say, I would imagine um, that the relationships with other human beings that we um, have and that we um, are hopefully lucky enough to 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 draw from in our lives uh, have that sort of um, utility and val uh, the utility, our capacity to be able to to gain from that. And there's also the the fact of just being relational. Um, beings where it's mm. in it for its own sake um, but uh, perhaps that's mm -hmm. my that's... uh just my take on that no it's true and I mean that's also the reason uh, there's so much to be gained and it's also the reason why um we have to be so careful to avoid making people feel excluded or rejected or unwelcome in some way because that has a really detrimental effect on 
their ability to learn as well. Um, I think the, um, the theory on, you know, why loneliness and social exclusion is so, um, so, you know, devastating to, to human health and well being mm -hmm. is that when we were, you know, um, uh, evolving in small clans and tribes to be left alone was, you know, not a good survival, survival um, outcome. And so when we are socially excluded, our brains may be responding to that as a literal kind of threat to our survival. Mm -hmm. And when you're worried about your literal survival on some even on some, you know, subconscious level, boy, that eats up a lot of your bandwidth. Now you're not really feeling um, like you've got a lot of extra um, cognitive energy to to be engaged in learning new things. So, um, yeah, so that can be a really, t you know, the the human relationships that are. <sighs> this is why people remember so clearly when someone said, you know, you'll never be able to do X or yeah. you don't belong here in some way, shape or form. You know, it's, it's, that's a really powerful and negative um, thing to have to overcome. It really is. Um, and I'm just thinking K through 12, but I'm sure into even tertiary education, that's mm -hmm. when, you know, uh, everyone's navigating and forming their sense of who am I in, in relation to this group or this community or this class? Um, what's my role? Do I belong? Do I not belong? Um, yeah. And I think there might be some classes. It's It's been a long time since I've been in primary and secondary school here in Australia. Mm -hmm. Um Mm -hmm. there might be some recognition of that, but sort of that it's more, you know, cover the STEM courses, science, maths, yeah. um, well, and all those social know, things kind of happen in the background. Right. And, and I think, you know, one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about recently has to do with um, the ways that the space that you enter communicates, you know, you belong here or you don't. And, the anonymity of the um, higher education or tertiary classrooms, I think, is a unintended um, um, dis it, it's not working for us in that. <laughs> so impersonal um that i mean no one really feels they belong there right like it's it's sort of like well this isn't i don't know whose space this is but it doesn't really belong to any of us um and i you know i just uh i think that the more aware we become of how important um it, it how much it matters for people to feel that the the academic spaces where they're you know doing this hard work mm -hmm. reflect a sense of um per, you know personal connection that you know your your handwriting has been on that whiteboard or your you know that you have moved around this space and sat in different places here and you've touched the furniture and you've Maybe at one point your um, uh, team has occupied the front of the room while you've been presenting some work that you did or, you know, all of those things contribute to your sense that you belong in this space. But the space itself is often, you know, the way it's been designed, um, not really offering you that kind of sense of connection and belonging. So you know, and everything matters. Are there, you know, are there plants in the room? Are there, mm -hmm. um, uh, is there natural light? Is there, you know, is it, um, a space with some, some colors that, you know, humans tend to find soothing or, you know, comfortable. 
how does the ceiling height affect the the space of the room um i mean you know primary school teachers i think you know have been very careful to design their spaces in ways that welcome their students yeah. um and somehow you know we've we've adopted this belief that um adults don't need a welcoming space <laughs> but you know now that we've all um um been you know through this pandemic and we you know have have been exposed to a much different experience of space mm -hmm. you know because we're not just mindlessly now going through like well I'll be here and then I'll be there and um you know we we're much more conscious of the ways that space matters um it's uh it's one of the sort of highlights that when i was reading about it in in your book um left me both hopeful of um those examples and there's initiatives and things out there of whether it's primary school or other schools that actually or teachers that want to take people outside and really are conscious of those important factors left me both hopeful and a little bit sad of knowing mm -hmm. that you know it, in very many ways it's um still still the same in universities around the world mm -hmm. and high schools mm -hmm. so uh I yeah and and if I could interrupt just to yeah. say, you know, I think the idea that we'll be, you know, teaching outside or that we'll be much more conscious of the particular um, landscape and history of the, you know, of the, in the culture of the place where our school is, um, doesn't have to mean that you, you, comp you, you, you completely change what you do in a classroom every single day. It just means maybe we'll go outside a couple of times <laughs> over the next few months, right? Or yeah. maybe we'll, you know, we, we don't have to um, toss out everything that we've ever done before in order to be a little bit more receptive to the way brains are, you know, optimized to to learn but um but we certainly can change a little bit at a time mm. and see how it goes right like um baby steps yeah baby steps well i i think perhaps in the um just the awareness of the time that we have uh mm -hmm. i because there's a few sort of uh questions that i would like to ask you before we finish um in terms mm -hmm. of the 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 other principles of embodied cognition that people can um, find out more about. Um, there's also that each of us affects the embodied ecosystem of others around us. Um, mm -hmm. There's the knowledge that knowledge is constructed through embodied experience. I think that's a really important one that, um, and I guess for me, uh, the way that I uh, that that resonated for me was that the knowledge and learning we're we're sort of hoping to support and foster in um, students uh, is going to be really handicapped if if they're doing that in a very static only, as you pointed out, baby steps. Perhaps there's a little bit of traditional static um, learning within a environment but then when it's not in sort of embodied um with with some more movement or experience that's relevant to that learning um that can have a real impact um mm -hmm. yes and then um, i should say i think it's really interesting that you use the word handicapped just because ah um, yes. i recently um met and and read the book of sarah kuhn k-u-h-n um, her book's called Thinking with Things. 
and she has done a lot of work. She and I are definitely um, work, working the same groove. Um, she's done a lot with manipulatives in the classroom. So she uses Lego and, and she, this is in a tertiary higher ed setting as well. Mm -hmm. um, and what she says is that because our hands um, are so um, dominant in our if you if you look at the way that the um, space of a brain is kind of devoted to different parts of your body, you're, if you've seen that homunculus yeah. drawing, right, it's got giant hands, right? So she says, if you don't ask students to use their hands, you're disabling them because that's just such a huge way that human beings are are designed to learn and i just find that both radical and and profound you know she also uh sarah coon um makes the point that um <laughs> the standard academic classroom might be um labeled a sensory deprivation chamber wow okay <laughs> which i thought was great it's great and uh, yeah, it's it's it's. I often find that something that's humorous has humor to it, but it also uh, can make a truth land really profoundly. Yes. Um, and I think one of the things that I'm aware of, especially if if there's any listeners who are working within a school um, in any capacity, it's less about that they're not doing um, a good job, but about the um, legacy system and structures that we have and, and uh, of education and how that should look um, in terms of, I guess, where I'm coming from and where I think your book is coming from. Um, but that is a powerful image. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think um, that when you start, realizing how um the world is organized to be sedentary mm. it, it just it's sort of shocking like um and and again i mean i've i i've had such a um delightful time really um discovering books like um the chair um, which is a, a book by a Stanford design specialist whose name is escaping me now, um, or a book called Primate Change by um, a British academic named Vibar Cregan Reed. And he argues that, you know, there are more chairs per capita. There, there's enough chairs in the world for every human to have something like eight chairs or something it's ridiculous um but you know we we're not we're not really built to just sit in chairs like that's not good for us and in fact it has shaped our bodies to um give us to create pain so we experience a lot of back pain and joint stiffness because our hamstrings are too short. Our Achilles tendons are too short because we just sit too much. And um, the um, the there's been an epidemic of um, myopia or nearsightedness in, in children um, in recent years because they're not getting enough natural daylight and they're not looking out into distances like at clouds and trees and things because they're not running around outside. And so their eye muscles behind their retina <clears throat> are being affected and it's affecting, you know, everyone's need for prescription eyeglasses. And so, um, it's, you know, we, this is, these are the ways that we don't really pay attention to our bodies as if they just, you know, or, or we, we accept the environments that we've become accustomed to. Like, well, of course a car involves sitting where, when you think about 
Well, we could have designed a car to be driven while standing, but we didn't. And, you know, we, I think we tend to engineer things for our ease and our comfort. Mm -hmm. And yet we've engineered an environment that is in fact harmful to our own well-being. I think it's so important for us to to cover these this side of the coin when it comes to education as well i think it's um uh yeah i'm filled with all sorts of emotions just even um hearing that and and recognizing that um i think it's something that if we have moments and time all of us can kind of acknowledge that it's really not okay um the way it's all set up the exclusion of our bodies in many ways in terms of health and and learning and um daily life as as a species um i'd like to sort of bring the the remainder of the conversation around some of what you started to cover in the end of the book uh which mm-hmm. um is around how uh, education and the the reimagining uh, the reimagining of education um, in all of what that means, even if that's in mm. maybe steps, um, is important in our collective ability to address um, what are called wicked problems. Um, um, did you want to speak a little bit about what, how, how you? Um, frame that and and what that means um sure the you know the the reason why a problem is wicked is that it's difficult to identify um or agree on what the cause of the problem is and then any potential solutions tend to create other unintended problems or you know it's just uh this is examples of wicked problems would be like climate change um and in which you know there's just it's it's um complication upon complication but in order to make any headway at all in dealing with wicked problems humans need to really um collaborate well and we need to be able to to optimize the ways that our diverse brains can um supplement each other's you know shortcomings so that if we all perceive um the situation differently like a kaleidoscope you know we can kind of dial in our understandings of different um phenomena by by being able to communicate and collaborate well together. Um, And the ways that humans um, are more inclined to collaborate well or to, to develop a more cooperative mindset turn out to be physical as well. So sharing um, movement together with other people, walking together with other people, um performing any kinds of um motions that require you to be to coordinate your your limbs so even just passing dishes say around a table um or um whether other other examples would be you know actually doing um activities that are you know we think of more in the realm of like recreational things dancing dancing is just you know such a bonding human activity Mm -hmm. um especially dances that require you to learn steps and coordinate your movements with other people like those as it turns out predispose us to to wanting to work together Mm. just you know that we we are better problem solvers when we've had a chance to do something physical that requires us to coordinate our movements together. So I just think that is both really cool and important. 
extremely, extremely. Uh, yeah. I'm I'm realizing I'm mentioning a lot of like analogies and metaphors that are, as I said, yeah. at the beginning sprinkled throughout the book, but I did warn yeah. people. Um, I think you, you might cite someone else. Um, it's in chapter five, move around together, which is very relevant mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. what you were sharing. Yeah. Um, and it, there's that mention of um, the education as uh, if I was to sort of um, simplify it somewhat, because it's not all like this, but it's um, uh, might be simpler and easier to just keep continue with things as they are. And the analogy mm-hmm. or metaphor of a hamburger, so oh. junk food, <laughs> um, yeah. and that it's cheaper, cheaper and easier in the short term um, to continue with uh, sort of that more factory production line sort of. Uh, understanding and implementation of learning versus um, I don't know, you know, maybe healthy salads of, of that Mm -hmm. long-term transformative Mm -hmm. development, the hands-on, the active and the collaborative learning. Um, Yeah. How, how can we incentivize not just um, because I don't think any one person is sort of, holding on to the old ways of doing things and saying, no, it's not going to change. There's no sort of, um, sort of evil, you know, um, conspiracy to keep things the way they are. It's we're, we're all within a complex system. Um, Mm -hmm. and we have incentives, you know, parents care about their, their kids growing up and being successful and, um, happy and healthy. Um, in a market that in sort of incentivizes people to to be able to continue that sort of machine running. Um, so we're all just doing kind of the best we can. But mm-hmm. I wonder what your thoughts are, what your what you've noticed, what your hopes are in terms of what could start to move that. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right about the incentives, because at least in the in the world of higher education, teaching is not the most valued role of the the faculty member, at least in, you know, at certain prestige universities, which then set the kind of um, the model and the culture that gets filtered down to all the rest. And so the the thing that has changed is that um the the expert is no is no longer really valuable because of what they know because we we can get that information but we don't we don't need that human being to be the the vessel of that information. What we need that human being to do is to facilitate our perception of it, mm-hmm. to understand, you know, to actually um, coach us through to understand how learning works and to to provide a framework and a set of experiences and a and a process for um, learners to actually be able to construct that knowledge for themselves. And so our value as teachers has just completely shifted from the era when we were the repositories of, of knowledge. We're not, we can't just stand at the lectern and, and profess because that's really not where our value is is um, most important. And mm-hmm. so, um, yeah, I mean, how to change the structures to incentivize people who are good at facilitating learning. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a, you know, that's something I think about almost daily. That's, you know, part of part of what my work is in a center for teaching and learning is to work with my peers and colleagues. Um, and, um, 
yeah, I mean, I guess I would hope that on some level, once you start um, choosing to devote your intellectual energy to being a good facilitator of learning, it's just, um, it's a lot more pleasurable. It's just a lot more fun. You, you wouldn't want to go back to being um, a professor because it, it's a lot more fun to design active learning strategies and activities and be in there with the students kind of as their, their coach and their facilitator and their guide. Um, and our expertise is still critical because we're the curators of these experiences. You know, we're the ones who are providing the structure and the feedback, which is so important in learning, right? You, that you have to practice new skills and practice, um, um, you know, being able to problem solve or, or do new kinds of, use new kinds of vocabulary, identify new things that you didn't know how to notice before. And you need someone who can offer you wise feedback, supportive, you know, you, you're not there yet, but, but you can do this. I want you to keep, keep at it. And so, you know, we're, I think there's lots of interesting conversations going on now in higher ed about um, the system of grades, about, mm -hmm. you know, how those in some, in, in many very real ways work against learning um, because the student is, is only, um, um, you know, directed to be focused on earning this grade rather than what it's supposed to represent. Yeah. And so there's people doing all sorts of really exciting work about how to um, structure a learning experience that offers lots of practice and feedback and a you know, a system that it has a lot of reflection built in where the student themselves then is capable of evaluating their performance at the end of the term. Um, and so, you know, I think it feels exciting in 2023 to be, I think, firmly in the 21st century. Like you can feel it. You can feel oh. it coming. It's It's changing. I think so. I think so for sure. And thank you for sharing those um, those uh, hopes and those um, things that you're noticing that are that are happening in the space. Um, and I think that last piece you just said that you can feel that it's changing. I think that's really true. Like being very aware that we all have somewhat of a a bubble that we live in, and we interact with people who and speak with people who might have the same interests and, and passions and maybe even values mm -hmm. and worldviews. Um, that question that I asked you around, how can that shift happen, that change happen? I think what I'm kind of hearing from you and mm -hmm. I would agree is that in many ways it is happening. Um, mm -hmm. And I think the idea of a, a change, a, a, um, a revolution or an evolution or, you know, that it somehow needs to be this um, very distinct, obvious um, transformation that happens in front of our eyes, um, and that that's a you know a, a quick process or a um, smooth process. I, I don't think that sort of matches how real life and, and yeah. change happens. So um, I definitely I'm having more of these conversations just in day-to-day -day life. And I'm um, always excited to come across um, writings, books, like, like the one that you've written and um, hearing the stories of what's happening out there. Um, and I think those small sort of distributed, you know, all around the globe in different communities and classrooms and conversations between teachers and students um, are happening more and more. I think that there's actual evidence for that. And perhaps it's just the, the gradual increase in those sort of separate local shifts and changes and experiments really that will have students and 
adults come out the other end more capable, more fully able to meet sort of the more um, 21st century realities, um, yeah. asking questions differently. And, and that may slowly have some kind of a um, an effect. Yeah, yeah, I think so. The most interesting um, developments that that I find are sometimes where someone has figured out a way to nudge a rigid structure in a just a tiny it's like they've cracked it open in a tiny way that's different now than we used to be able to see it and that's all that's needed and then somebody else is going to find their way through that crack and it's going to widen further and um yeah so I think there's people are people are inventive and I'm constantly you know intrigued and amazed at the the innovative things that they'll they'll come up with wouldn't agree more um before we finish if there's any particular uh resources or um uh ways that people can learn more about your work um i do know that mm. you've got a website i'll include the I details do. in the notes but is there anything else you'd like to mention for people if they're we might have teachers students just people who are interested who could find out more um well i on my website there's links to other podcast conversations that i've had um and um some articles that have appeared about the book and its concepts um so i think that's probably the best place to find more info um, I also, you know, leaned heavily on some books that I, you know, have mentioned in this conversation, but, mm -hmm. um, but I'm just so grateful to have learned from, and, you know, maybe the, the prime one of those is, um, a book called Intelligence in the Flesh by Guy Claxton and it's it's a very accessibly written funny I I take my um um introductory um quote for the book from from that book he said my mind was not parachuted in to save and supervise some otherwise helpless concoction of dumb meat <laughs> which I thought was just great. And you're right. It's it, anytime we can work a little humor into um, some challenging thoughts, always, always, I think, you know, a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine to go down. Right. So I did, I was grateful to my publisher for allowing me to include some um, cartoons and uh, personal photographs in the book that I hoped would add a little levity. So it uh, it definitely did. It was a really um, really interesting and really easy read to just sort of absorb. Um, thank you so much for uh, making the time um, from all the way on the other side of the globe. Uh, Susan, well, thank you so pleasure. much for your interest. I am thrilled that you've taken up um, education as sort of a extended um, um, interest. And I, I was very interested in the last conversation that you had with, um, is it Michael Strong? Yeah. 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 I listened to that whole episode and wow. wished that I was there to kind of um, be a third conversation partner with you. So thank you for doing this work. Absolutely. Um, and as I say to uh, some of my guests, I, I find the conversations often very enriching and enlivened. Like I will often learn so much from the conversation and um, I'm always, uh, you know, I want to give an open invitation um, to come and speak again sometime in the future. Um, I, I find it uh, there's always more branches that open up and possibilities. So um, thank you so much, Susan, and I uh, uh, hope you all the best and have a good evening.
Thank you. It was, it was lovely to meet with you and um, I wish you all the best too, Jonas. If you enjoyed or learned from this episode, please subscribe and follow on wherever you listen to your podcasts so you never miss an episode.